presence of God, put those hands together and give him worship all over the room. Amen. Amen. Grab your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 13. I'm, I'm not breaking this, I'm shifting this. I'm going to do our stewardship decree at the end of the service today. I want you to have an understanding. We're in this series entitled The Tribe of Judah. Today, I want to, call, I want to preach to you for just a few minutes on the kill it praise. The kill it praise. <clears throat> the, the kill it praise. You must understand that praise shifts the atmosphere. If you will learn this, you will learn that you are built as a praiser to be a thermostat, not just a thermometer. You can come in and you can take the temperature if you want to and decide whether this is going to be a good service or this is going to be a great moment or whether the presence of the Lord is going to invade the place. Or you can make the decision that I am not satisfied with the degree of worship and, and presence that is in the room. And I, as an act of praise, am going to begin to appraise the Lord and bless his name. I got a little bit of feedback back here, Crystal, if you can help me. I want you to understand that, that this church has always had a spirit of praise on it. Let me say it another way. It has always had a spirit of praise in it. Because we've understood from its inception that the thing that brings God into our situation is not our ability to have great programs. It's not our ability to have great marketing. What brings God into a room to invade a space is people who have decided that they're going to appraise the Lord no matter their current situation or climate. I will submit to you today, one of the things I love about Judah Church is we are a spirit-filled church. <clears throat> and if you're not interested in spirit-filled, great, that's okay. We are very much interested in having the presence of the Lord not be a part of the service, but have the whole service. <clears throat> but hear me today, a spirit-filled church must be, um, must be arranged and, and brought into based upon a praise-filled person. You cannot have a spirit-filled church without praise-filled people. He's not going to come in and invade the place simply because you came to a place called church. The only thing he invades is praise, and I'm going to prove it to you in the text. We're obviously having technical difficulties this morning, and, and the Lord has messed with this in, in my message, so I had to change it up on these guys. And I want you to understand, we don't do false advertising here. <clears throat> Judah means... Judah means we will appraise the Lord. And the appraisal that we're going to give him is worthy of who he is in our life. And, and let me be very clear that our appraise is not a color thing. Our praise is not a denominational thing. Our praise is a kingdom thing. And the reason why we appraise him on the level we appraise him is not because everything is right in our life all the time. It's not because we got a different color or we got the same color or we got the same whatever that everybody would say, oh, this is just the climate and the atmosphere. No, this is the culture because this is a kingdom thing. And the reason it's a kingdom thing is because we have a king. Yeah. And we have a king who is worthy to be praised. And I'm not going to give my best praise to yesterday at the ball game. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. I'm not going to give my best praise to people that only took my money. I'm not going to only give praise to those people that I like the form and the fashion and the color of their, of their mascot. No, no, no. I'm going to appraise the Lord whether they want or not. I'm going to praise the Lord whether I'm healthy or not. I'm going to praise the Lord whether I feel like it or not because he is worthy of my appraisal. Does anybody hear what I'm saying today? Because you must understand that Judah Church was born in the fire and we are not satisfied with smoke. 
Let me say it again. We were born in the fire. We were bleeding. We were bloodied. We were wounded. We were isolated. We were talked about. We were ran through the mud. You, you don't hear what I'm saying. We were being waited on to fail. Our enemies were mounting up, waiting on that to happen. But listen, we couldn't be focused on what they did or what they didn't do. We had to get our face before God and say, God, what is it that you want to do in our lives? What is it that you want to do in this city? And this house was born in fire, and we will not be satisfied with smoke and mirrors. We will not be satisfied with moving lights and great sound effects. No, we want the fire of the Holy Ghost. I'll say it. The fire of the Holy Ghost to be evident and real. This is a presence-driven house. We will not be satisfied with smoke. We are not quiet. We are not silent. We know when to shut up. And then we know when to praise up. This is a noisy place. This is a clamorous place. I'm going to prove it to you over the next few weeks. This is a clamorous place because we're not just trying to make great noise. We're trying to give God great praise. Come on, somebody. As a matter of fact, let's just take a praise break right here and just give him praise all over the room. Praise him on the level he's worthy of. Somebody bless him on the level he's worthy of. Somebody thank him on the level he's worthy of. Not to the church, but to you. If he woke you up this morning, you want to praise him. If he gave you breath in your lungs, you want to thank him. If you have the ability to stand, you want to stand and praise him. If you can extend your arms, you want to extend your... And sometimes it's just the fact we're still here is enough to bless him. Some of you should have been killed. The car wreck should have killed you. You should have already committed suicide. You should have already been in the funny fun but he still made a way even when there seemed to be somebody bless the name of Jesus ha. it shifts the mood it shifts the atmosphere I'm telling you get outside of your selfishness get outside of your pouts get outside of your weeny whiny worship I dare you to praise him because he's good in the good times he's good in the bad he's good when they're cheering he's good when they're somebody praise the Lord because he's worthy he's worthy he's worthy to be praised oh oh, oh, oh. oh I feel the old thing coming on me now I feel the old oh, oh, oh. I came from the old church. I came when we praise him until we felt like praising. I came to we worship till we felt like worshiping. We praise him until every chain fell off. We praise him until you don't understand what I, I just, oh, oh, oh. I know it looks like new school, but there's an old school praise. Hey! Back it up now. We will never outgrow his worth. You understand what I'm saying today? We will never outgrow his worth. He's worthy in the first service. He'll be worthy in the second service. And he'll be worthy even in the third service. And y'all, I done decided we're going to dance with the one who got us here. This is found in the book of Ezekiel chapter 9. Ezekiel chapter 9. Watch this. The Lord said to them, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem. Watch this. And put a mark on the worshipers. Praisers carry a mark on them. They are marked by God. God said, I want you to put a mark on the praiser. I want you to find somebody that's willing to bless me whether they feel like it or not. Because I'm going to put a mark on them. He didn't just say a mark in them, but in Revelation chapter 11, verse 1, I need you to understand. The Bible says that he was given a reed of a measuring rod. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God. Measure the altar. This is why we're building. Because God is going to come in and measure. He's going to measure how many temples have been built in his name and how many temples have been built in other people's names.
I'm going to measure the temple of God. Uh-oh, we're going to mess with 2023 church, and I'm going to measure the altar. I'm going to measure how many people come to lay down a sacrifice. I'm going to measure how many people are willing to come and kill something in my presence. And then I want you to measure those who worship there. So not only do praises carry a mark, they also carry a measure. I wonder today what kind of measure we would get if God measured our praise today. Are you satisfied with the measure of praise you've given him? But the better question for you and me this morning is, is he satisfied with the measure of praise we've given him? The Bible tells us in John chapter 9, verse 31, that anyone who is a worshiper of God and does his will, he will hear him. Do you understand? That when he finds somebody who's willing to praise him, in spite of what they're in or in spite of what they're going through, and they'll operate according to the obedience of his steps that he has ordered of them, that there is an ear of God that is inclined to the praiser. You are marked and you are measured. Praising and being a praiser are not the same thing. Let me say it to you again. Praising and being a praiser is not the same thing. This is more than what I do. This is who I am. I have learned in 47 years of living that he is worthy of it all. I have learned it by watching my great-grandmother. I have learned it by watching my grandparents. I have learned it by watching my mother and father. And I have learned it in the 47 years of my own life that this is not something I do. This is the essence of who I am. I find strength when I get outside of myself and bless him anyway. I find peace when I praise him even in the midst of my storm. I find joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. Even in great seasons of pain, I've learned that the secret to pushing me beyond where I am into the essence of where he's called me to be is if I will shake myself of myself and give him a praise that he is worthy of. So hear me today. If only in moments like this do you praise, you don't Boom. You're not a praiser, you carry it. If the only time he's worthy is when you get in moments and atmospheres like this, you don't, you, you're not a praiser, you carry praise. If the sound is right, if the key is right, if the atmosphere is right, if it is conducive to your current climate and situation, you're not a praiser, you carry praise. But praisers understand, we don't carry praise, but praise carries us. It'll carry us right out of depression. It'll carry us right out of our pit. It'll carry us right out of our pity party. It'll carry us right out of our self. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. I don't know why, but I feel the Holy Ghost trying to yank you out of your pity party today. Trying to yank you out of your victimhood today. Praise will position you for victory. Because praisers know that praise carries them. So they don't have to carry it. This is so evident in the Old Testament. There were 12 tribes of Israel. Judah was the first and the largest tribe. The second tribe that was largest was the tribe called Dan. Dan was the tribe that was closest to Judah. It was Judah that would go first and then Dan would go second. It was the second largest of the tribe. Listen, Judah would go, praise would go first, and then Dan would go second initially. <clears throat> but we find out in the book of Judges chapter 18 that Dan found a place called Laish. And they walked into a place called Laish. And Dan, the tribe that was closest to Judah, the ones that were directly connected with praise found a place called Laish, and watch this, they deemed it to be a quiet place. They deemed it to be a secure place. They deemed it to be a place that had no shame attached to it and a place where they didn't have to answer to anybody. So they decided that they were going to not stay with Judah. They were going to live in Laish. 
because they liked it quiet. They liked it easy. They liked it secure. They liked where they didn't have to worry about being ashamed. They liked the place where they didn't have to answer to nobody. And the Bible says that Judah didn't stop. Judah kept on moving. Praise kept going and then settled for a quiet, secure place. They were the second largest tribe in the tribe of Israel. But you'll find in the book of Revelation, I believe it's chapter number 7, where God says that Manasseh took over the place of Dan. Why? Because they were pulled out of position because they wanted comfort. They were pulled out of position because they wanted security. They were pulled out of position because they got too professional and didn't want to be ashamed. They, they didn't want to find shame, somebody to find shame in their praise. And, and they got pulled out of position because because, uh, because they didn't want to answer to nobody. But hear me today. The greatest thing you can do in the greatest seasons of your life is not settle for quiet. It's not settle for secure. It's not settle for where there's no embarrassment and there is no shame. No. The greatest thing you can do is stay attached to Judah. The greatest thing you can do is stay attached to praise. I know it looks easy over there, but you'll settle and miss your inheritance. You'll settle and miss your blessing if you don't stay connected to Judah. Judah. I, I'm not talking about the church. This is not a cult. I'm talking about a culture of praise. Well, I just don't know that the Lord needs all that. Well, you're wrong. Psalm 119, and the reason why you never hear this passage quoted is because nobody takes the time to read the whole thing. Psalm 119, verse 164, David said seven times a day, I'm going to praise you because of your righteous just seven times a day. Do you know what he said? He said seven times a day, I take a praise break. Some of you take cigarette breaks. Some of you take coffee breaks. Some of you take vape breaks. So, Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Some of you take sleep breaks. But David said, I'm going to take a praise break. And I'm going to do it seven times a day. Y'all, he would go outside of his job. And he would bring the fire. And he would bring something to consume with the fire. And he would light that thing up. He didn't just go, let me take a 30-second praise break. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now I'm going to go back to my job. He said, no. What song am I going to sing today? What instrument am I going to build today? Maybe that's what some of you need to do with your stinking thinking, with your victim mentality, is put a reminder in your calendar seven times a day. Every seven minutes, every two hours, I'm going to take me a praise break. I'm going to go outside. If they can smoke, I can praise. If they can vape, I can say thank you, Jesus. If they can go out there and act a fool and say all kinds of stuff, then I ought to be able to act a fool too and give him clear. Somebody take a praise break right here. To take a praise break. You've been complaining for four days. It's time for you to take a praise break. Somebody you've been stressed out for all week. You want to take a praise break. Somebody you've been all worried. You couldn't even sleep last night. You want to take a break from your worry and give God a praise. And he's Just in case you're wondering, I feel like preaching. Why? Because Psalm 22, see if this sounds familiar. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Does that sound familiar? Jesus on the cross was not bringing something to God that he hadn't already studied. Through his father David. He was echoing Psalm 22 on the cross. This dude was in the hardest season of his life in humanity. And he was still quoting scripture. Praise is not just for the easy season. Why are you so far from helping me, God? And from the words of my groanings. This is not the easy season. 
Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime and you do not hear. And in the night season and I am not silent. But I like big butts. You ready? But you are holy and are enthroned in praise. I need you to understand today, God does not inhabit pain. He inhabits praise. God does not inhabit problems. He inhabits praise. God does not inhabit complaining. He inhabits praise. If you ever want God to step into your pain, give him praise in your pain. If you ever want him to step into your problem, give him praise in the middle of your problem. If you ever want him to deal with your complaint, you got to give him the praise in the midst of your complaint. He is only enthroned. You hear me? Only a spirit-filled church can be created by a praise-filled people. And that was all introduction. <laughs> Here's Hebrews 13. What do you do in difficult times? Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise unto God that is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. He is pleased with praise in easy times. But what well pleases God is when you praise him when it's not an easy time. Here's what I've learned. There are two things that the enemy will use to rob you of your praise, which will rob you of your blessing. You ready? He'll use yesterday, and he'll use tomorrow. I could have quit right there. He will use yesterday to rob you of his praise today. Because you'll be so focused on what happened yesterday, what they did to you, what you did to them, what you did to yourself. And he will rob you of the praise he's worthy of today by reminding you of what happened yesterday, yesteryear, yestermonth, yesterdecade. He'll use yesterday, but he'll also use tomorrow. He will put such anxiety and fear in you of what may happen that it will rob you of the opportunity of what he's worthy of in this moment. But, but David showed this to us, and then the writer of Hebrews made it firm in our lives that in spite of yesterday and in spite of tomorrow, this is the moment where I will continually offer him the sacrifice. That word sacrifice in the Greek, watch this, it means to kill with purpose. Ah, uh, help me, Holy Spirit. In other words, in my praise, something has to die. So I'm going to kill on purpose. I'm not waiting for God to do a drive-by death of what he doesn't want in my life. But I'm going to grab the thing that is robbing me of the praise that he's worthy of. And I am going to put it on the altar of my life. And I am going to intentionally sacrifice it for the purpose of giving him praise. To kill with a purpose. Most of us struggle with the sacrifice of praise because we really like how smart we are. We really like the place in our life. Human understanding, pride, and self-reliance have to die in praise. And it has to die even if it makes no sense. I remember when, when my, my wife and I, we went through this a miscarriage before Noah was born. We'd been trying for three and a half years to get pregnant, and it was about this time of the year, heading into November. 
And I remember in, the, in that moment, the greatest joy and the greatest terror. Because the stick said pregnant, but her body was saying she was still in her cycle. For three and a half years, we've been trying, and, and in those days, that was a really long time in our minds. You know what it's like when you're used to microwave? And in the moment of great joy was also a moment of great anxiety and perplexity. Thanksgiving Day, we realized it wasn't going to work. Her body was rejecting the child. We were in Columbus, Ohio at Thanksgiving with my in-laws. And I walked outside. My in-laws at that time had five acres of land. And I walked away from everybody, including them, because I had to, I had to build something in me. And let me just stop here long enough. Ladies, men suffer too. We just suffer different. We grieve too. It's just different. And I had to walk down that long driveway, Columbus, Ohio, Thanksgiving, and say, Lord, I got a lot of questions because this makes no sense to me. But I'm going to stand right here in what looks like going to be the greatest pain of my life. I say, you're still worthy. And though you slayed this baby, yet will I praise you. See, I didn't have the revelation. I didn't have the revelation at that stage uh, that before he was formed or she was formed in her mother's womb, he already knew her. He already knew him. I got one waiting on me up there, y'all. Do you understand? I got one waiting on me up there. I don't know if it's a he or a she, but I know it's a gee. It's a glen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> and I got one waiting on me up there. But it was a... I only had one chance to steward praise in that moment. Thanks be unto God. I've never had to go through that again. It was my one shot as it relates to miscarriage to choose whether I would live in the pain or in spite of the pain tell him he's still worthy. And I'm here to tell somebody you may be going through the greatest valley of the shadow of death it is your one shot to steward well that he's worthy even in this. This is what a sacrifice of praise is. When you're not thrilled with where you are, but you're still satisfied with who he is. Here's why, ladies and gentlemen, I'm ending here. Because praise requires you to confront your pride. Gotta hurry. It requires you to confront your pride. Hear me. A real sacrifice of praise will not happen in your comfort zone. It is not about my personality. Well, that's not my personality. It's not my temperament. That's a good thing. When you're able to praise him beyond your temperament, when you're able to praise him beyond your personality, when you're able to praise him beyond your comfort zone, that's where real sacrifices of praise is given. And I hear so many people say, well, I'm just going to swallow my pride and I'm just going to lift my hands. I'm just going to swallow my pride and I'm going to raise my voice. I'm just going to swallow my pride. Don't swallow your pride because if you swallow your pride, that means it's still in you. Do not swallow your pride, kill your pride, destroy your pride. With a purpose, I am going to sacrifice my pride, and I'm going to tell him he's worthy. And he's still good, even if my situation isn't. It requires you to confront your pride. 
Watch this. Praise will kill pride or pride will kill praise. But the good news is you get to choose which dies. Praise will kill pride. Pride will kill praise. But you get to choose which dies. This is why you and I must praise him on the level of what he can do. Faith comes in praise. I'm going to prove it to you here in just a second. When I get outside of the fear or the shame of yesterday and the fear of tomorrow and I begin to praise him in the day that he's made, do you know it shifts me from fear to faith? And faith, the, the spirit of expectancy, is the breeding grounds for the miraculous. What that means is that when I put posture myself as a praiser and he is enthroned, that means sickness doesn't have the final say. That means despair doesn't have the final say. It doesn't have the last word over my situation. And I shift the atmosphere as a praiser in me and then in my home and then at my job and then at my church. And it is all shifted by what I'm going to build for him to come and be enthroned in. Play a little bit for me, Antoine. Well, hmm, this may not be this service because y'all buck wild for the most part at 830. But humor me, let me practice on you for a minute for the, for the 10 and the, the noon. For all my quiet church folk, you're going to be in trouble if you make it to heaven. I'm just telling you, you're going to be in trouble. Your nerves are going to be shot if he doesn't give you new nerves. Because according to Revelation chapter 1, I mean chapter 8 verse 1, there will only be 30 minutes of silence in heaven. Y'all, when we get there, it's going to be buck slam wild. And then God's going to come down. Jesus is going to be like, all right, all right, hey, 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 shh, shh, shh. Have you ever tried to wrangle in everybody? It's hell on earth, man. Hey, shh. Hey, 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 hey. Hey, y'all calm down. Calm down. Hey, hey, shh. All right, all right. Have you ever tried to make Spanish people be quiet? They'll just change it to another language, think that it doesn't make sense. And because it doesn't make sense, we can't hear it. We still hear it. Shh. And, and for 30 minutes, ain't nobody going to say nothing. You know what I believe is going to happen for those 30 minutes? Every one of us are going to sit there and go, okay, he said be quiet, let's be quiet. And then we're going to begin to think. Can you believe we're standing here? Can you believe that's really him? Y'all, Jesus just told me to silencio, por favor. Can, can you, he just shushed me. The one who saved me shushed me. Look at my son over there. Look at my daughter over there. Oh my goodness, there's my great grandmother. There's my grandmother and my grandfather. The last time I saw my dad, he was eaten up with leukemia. But look at that God of mercy. He's standing there straight. You want me to be quiet? Oh my goodness, there's Noah and there's Moses and there's Abraham and there's James and there's John. Ooh. 
there's a little kid over there. Oh, Lord have mercy, it looks just like me. And you want me to be... Y'all, when that half hour is up, y'all better get out my way or you better get a triangle upon a triangle. Some of y'all don't even know what I'm talking about. That's for black church folk. Because I'm going to hurt you and I'm going to hurt me. And I'm a, because when I think that for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, I get to stand at the very feet of the one who died for me with all of the ones that have gone before me and with all the ones that are coming after me. And you're going to put me on a time limit and I'm going to have time to sit there and actually think of how good he's been to me. Those times when I thought I was going to give up, those times when I wanted to give in, those times when I didn't think he even heard my prayers. But here I am standing on streets of gold, looking at walls of jasper, looking at gates of pearl. There's a mansion with my name on it, but I'm less consumed by all the stuff, and I'm more consumed about the lamb that was slain that has now become the lion of the tribe of Judah that has written on his name, on his thigh King of Kings and Lord of Lords and I'm looking at the one with eyes like fire and I'm looking at the one with hair like wool and in his came out a sharp two-edged sword and I'm sitting here going you want me to be quiet? You want me to be silent? Oh my goodness, it's going to take me 10,000 years just to get started at how awesome and how thankful I am. If I had 10,000 tongues, it would never be enough for me to tell him how worthy he is, how faithful I am, how worthy he is, and how faithful I am. And about the time I get tired, I'm going to grab the hand of my grandma and grab the hand of my grandpa and say, thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. It was my sacrifice, but it was temporary. Thanks be unto God who's given me the victory. Does anybody hear what I'm saying today? It's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. This sacrifice is no sacrifice in light of where I'm headed. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we ain't got time for 30 minutes. But for 30 seconds, I won't, don't even play. For 30 seconds, I'm going to get... In heaven, we're going to get 30 minutes. But at Judah right here, we're going to take 30 seconds. And I want you to sit in 30 seconds of silence and think of what he's done for you. You ready? 30. Twenty. Fifteen. Ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. And I
right here. Somebody praise break right here and bless the Lord with all your soul and all that is within you. Bless his holy name. I dare you to praise him on the level he's worthy of. Even if you're in pain, even if you're going through problems, and maybe you're in the greatest struggle of your life, somebody offer to God the sacrifice of praise. The sacrifice of praise. Yeah. 